Александр Кубиков, у нас перед после самого встречения с Кириллом и Боксом, да, с вами на альбине. Нам нашего Добрый вечер всем, очень рад, что вы сегодня собрались. Благодарю вас. Слышно? Не слышно. Добрый вечер. Да, так, наверное, лучше. А, еще раз добрый вечер. Большое спасибо, что вы нашли время собраться и а, провести эти два часа вместе с нами. Еще раз представлю себя и своего коллегу. Меня зовут Александр Куликова. Я руководитель а, по связям со стороны Восточной Европы Центральной Азии корпорации ICAM. А, я хотела бы представить своего коллегу, который впервые не только в Киеве, не только в Украине, но и в принципе в нашей части света, в этом регионе Карлос Айлес, директор по вопросам стабильности и безопасности отказоустойчивости в офисе CTO корпорации ICANN. Он работает э, в Майами, мы сейчас нелегко в Киеве, но он очень рад э, оказаться здесь. И э, на самом деле я должна отметить, что э, этот формат лекции, а у нас настоящий роуд-шоу получается вот, принять, э, сегодня, завтра, послезавтра у Карлса Гастроли по вопросам злоупотребления ДНС. Этот, этот формат в нашем регионе проводится впервые. Поэтому нам очень интересно будет услышать и ваше мнение о, о том материале, который будет представлен. Нам будет, будет очень интересно посмотреть на то, какие аудитории мы соберем и какие акценты нам необходимо будет в следующем расставить именно для украинской публики. И, конечно, хотелось бы, в общем, русские лекции проводить и в других странах тоже. Но на данный момент мы подумали, что это одна из самых жутепищих тем, вопросы, касающиеся устойчивости глобальной идеальной инфраструктуры, касающиеся тех угроз, которые существуют, и в том числе с точки зрения бизнеса, я так понимаю, что у нас аудитория деловая здесь собралась сегодня. Почему? Об этом и почему мы, корпорация ICANN, интернет-корпорация по присвоению имен адресов, это не коммерческая корпорация, тем не менее у нас гибридный статус, который имеет свою штаб-квартиру штаб -квартиру в Лос-Анджелесе, но на данный момент все более, более глобализированная организация, которая видит свои миссии, своей основной задачей, которая которую можно определить как общественное благо, это поддержание как раз и стабильности, безопасности, отказоустойчивости, это наша мантра и наша миссия, глобальная система уникальных идентификаторов интернет. В этом мы, естественно, не действуем одни, у нас масса технических партнеров по всему миру, это иначе быть бы не могло, поскольку интернет – это разветвленная, распространенная архитектура, скажем так. В то же время мы отвечаем за выработку политик управления доменным пространством доменов верхнего уровня, прежде всего, но и также имеем определенное влияние на выработку таких политик доменов второго, второго уровня и далее тоже. Так или иначе, сегодня мы фокусируемся именно на вопросы безопасности ДНС. Этим и занимается офис СТО, не вся команда офиса СТО, которая на самом деле небольшая, всего 10 человек. И та подкоманда, которая, которая как раз таки фокусируется на, во-первых, оперативной работе, а во-вторых, на тренинговой работе а, по объяснению того, какие существуют уязвимости, как с ними работать, как а, помогать, а, как, как работать с другими ведомствами, участвующими в расследовании каких-то преступлений, например, их буквально 3-4 человека, один из них стоит перед вами. Поэтому э, сегодня у нас э, будет очень гибкий формат, у Карлоса есть лекция, есть э, подготовленный материал, но также мы оставили достаточно времени на то, чтобы можно было завязать живую дискуссию, чтобы вы могли задать э, интересующие вас вопросы, естественно, обменяться контактами на будущее. И э, мы просто хотели бы, чтобы это действительно было не просто лекционное мероприятие в одну сторону, а чтобы мы могли получить от вас тот фидбэк, который мы не получим ни в другой 
другой возможности в стране, не только в этом регионе, но и вообще, потому что, конечно, есть и глобальные проблемы, а есть очень специфические региональные. Поэтому, пожалуйста, не, не стесняйтесь и а, а, воспользуйтесь этой возможностью. Как еще раз подчеркну, это впервые. Мы делаем впервые такой формат, надеюсь, что не последний. На этом я остановлюсь и передаю слово Карлосу. Карлос, это Лорис I would prefer not to use the microphone. Can you guys in the back hear me well? Yeah? Okay. So I'll put it aside. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Um, the topic that we're going to talk about today, and thank you to Tatiana, Olga, for, for having organized this. It's a great opportunity to come here and speak with you all and share a little bit uh, uh, about this that I'm sure it's going to have a bit of, um, uh, it's going to be a bit of a new perspective for, for some of you, if not to all of you. Um, so uh, I, I guess, I presume, I have no idea. But I presume that Alexandra talked a little bit about what I can eat and what I can does. Um, and the only thing I missed was my name. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. It was put to the nice contest. Yeah, I, I saw some other faces. <laughs> um, so uh, I can was created in 1988, and it was tasked with uh, helping. Uh, facilitate the technical coordination of the domain name system. Uh, put in a very simplified uh, statement. Um, ICANN, the organization, facilitates the creation of the policies that have to deal, that have to do with the uh, generic top level domains on one hand. Um, the generic top level domains are those that are at the rightmost part of the gut. When you go to the browser and you see the little bar on top and you write the address that you want to go to, there can be one or more dots. The part that's at the rightmost part, that's the TLD that's going to tell you whether you're going to a generic or a country code. .ua is your country code, for example, it's two characters only. Now, I can also facilitate um, the development of uh, policies that the country codes want to develop for themselves within what's called the country code. Uh, name supporting organization. Uh, and without getting too much into all that policy space, it's very interesting, but it's not far from here. Um, let, let's go into into a little more uh, focus uh, and, and get talking about security and, and threats that have to do with the DNS. So in my team, my team is called the Security Stability and Resiliency Team, which is a annoying long name for what we do, um, but security, stability, and resiliency is kind of the mantra that ICANN has, has the mandate to pursue, and that's the, what we call the SSR of the system. We have to help the community, um, the operators of the infrastructure, that means the operators of those who operate the services. What services? The services, uh, the registration services, that means those who let you go on uh, register a domain name, and also those that uh, have servers and devices that can help you interact with domain names, like the internet service providers. Um, yeah, it's uh, just as an example that they operate part of the infrastructure on which the domain name system works. Um, and why is it relevant to talk about the domain name system or, or or put more simple, why is it relevant to talk about domain names when you're talking about security in a, in a corporate scenario such as yours? You, 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 you all come from business uh, companies, all of you are entrepreneurs or have your own businesses, so why is this relevant to you? Cybersecurity is, of course, nowadays uh, something that's um, in everyone's mouth. There are everyday articles in the press, there's all these new things in the media that talk about cybersecurity. Um, companies are investing more and more in the protection of their own informational assets. That's known, that's a trend, and that's good. Um, but this bit is a little bit unknown. What we're going to see here is a little bit unknown. And I want you to become a little bit more familiar with it. Um, because it's um, the exploitation of the DNS as a protocol. The DNS is several things, if you want. It's on one hand the global system that allows for the operation 
of the domain name so that users can um, precisely use the online resources that they, that they want or need. Uh, it is also a technical protocol that's part of a larger suite of protocols that's called TCP IP. And that's basically the suite of protocols on which the internet runs. Um, so it's vulnerabilities within the protocol, it's vulnerabilities within the processes that allow for the creation of the domain names, it's vulnerabilities within the process that allow the domain names to resolve. And I'll show what, what it means um, when I talk about, or whenever you read about domain name resolution, we'll talk about that. Um, and um, I hope that from this um, conversation that we're going to have now, you come out with a little bit of, of enhanced awareness on, 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 on aspects of cybersecurity that may, you may not have considered. And while cybersecurity as such is not a matter that's within I can scope, because it's, it's tangential to what you do, because it has to do with abuse of the protocol and abuse of the registration services of the domain names and with DNS infrastructure like those servers that are out there that let my device find the IP address for the website that I need to visit, then it's something that we talk about. We want people to be aware of how the DNS works, how they can make use of it, um, and also how they can protect themselves for the threats that are out there that exploit the DNS and that can affect them or their business. So first I'm going to give you a bit of background on, on a few significant threats that make use of the DNS. Then we'll move and show uh, how the DNS is used as a vector attack. Then um, uh, we'll talk about some countermeasures that can be implemented to uh, mitigate some of these threats. And then we'll just get to some conclusions. Feel free to interrupt me at any moment. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, uh, I don't want this to be a monologue. That's not the idea. Um, so but if it's possible, let's make it as interactive as possible. That, that, that's how we can make it uh, more rich, this, this interaction. Domain name registration. Criminals use domain names for all sorts of things. Um, it's, I'm going to give it a different twist, a different tweak. I'm going to put it from a different perspective. Domain names can be used just as a knife can be used. You can use it to cut a piece of meat that you are going to cook and eat. Or you can use it to peel an apple and eat it. Or, or a thief. A criminal can use it to kill someone. Domain names um, are used by both good guys, legitimate businesses, uh, parents, students, uh, governments, and the criminals also, of course, started using them some years ago um, and unfortunately are using them too much. Um, so there's an ongoing fight to prevent that from happening. Uh, a few things have to happen for, for that. Use that they do of the domain names can be diminished, but that's an ongoing process in which not only I can, but all the community is working towards um, more or less depending on the region, more or less depending on, on, on the different circumstances. But, but I, I would dare to say that in general, people are heading towards that direction. Let's somehow fight abuse of domain names. These are three very simple examples. This guy is a pretty bad guy. Uh, the FBI considers him um, as the head of a criminal organization that in 2013, 14, early 2014, between February and April, I don't remember, sorry, I don't remember well, um, was operating to botnets. Do you know the concept of botnet? Are you familiar with that concept? Some yes, others not so much. So basically, if, if I am a criminal and I want to make a lot of money, and I have someone who knows how to write code, how to write scripts, 
or I can do it myself. I can write some form of malware. Um, and then I can um, hijack domains or register them myself through different means, even hiding my own information or using fake information. That can happen, unfortunately. It can be corrected, but it can help. Um, use those domain names to send thousands of spam emails to my to my victims, um, luring them or inviting them to do something that they wouldn't do if they knew the consequences, uh, which would basically be either open the file or click on the link or display the image or go somewhere that asks them, if you want to watch the video, you have to download this app or whatever of those things that you can find in spam emails. Um, to see how many of those devices I can compromise or get compromised with the malware that I wrote. Once the devices start getting compromised and the number of compromised devices starts going up, then I will have a group of machines that I can use in whichever way I want. Those compromised devices are called bots, which is uh, like a, a, an abbreviation of robot. Um, um, and the, the, that's the bot part and the net part, which is basically the abbreviation for network. So it could be a robot network because they, they, the operator of that criminal infrastructure is actually operating it from the distance um, and being able to, to have those compromised devices do whatever the malware allows them to do. A compromised device can be used to launch attacks against third parties. Um, if I have compromised one of your servers, um, I can use your server to launch an attack against my competitor. And what happens from a legal standpoint? And this, I, I don't know anything, and I'm sorry that I don't. I don't know anything about civil law in Ukraine. But think of the. Uh, liability implications that that could have. If a company within Ukraine or in any other country sees that an attack is coming from your network, and then their lawyer calls you, hey, what's going on? They're attacking you. You've caused damages. So there, there's a lot of implications um, that one has to think about. Just keep those things in mind. It's usually that that's like buried somewhere and people don't realize there's many implications on all these things. Then think of the timeline. The criminal gets the malware, the code, uh, either developed by himself or herself, or bought uh, via an underground market, um, or they just rent out. Well, that's a different scenario. I'm not going to talk about the content rental business, which is very profitable. Not that I'm inviting you to get involved in it, <laughs> but they make money. They make a lot of money, unfortunately. So go back to the timeline. The guy gets the malware code. The guy gets the domains. The spam emails get sent out. The victims get compromised. Now, um, the first thing that happens when those devices get compromised is that the code in the malware um, will send in an automatic fashion, a call to the criminal server, to the server that the criminal uh, set up for being for him to be able to, um, the, the expression is to command and control his infrastructure. So the compromised devices establish a, a channel of communication with the criminal's server. Um, and what means of communication um, do criminals use to establish that line of communication, the DNS. Um, and why? Because the traffic, the DNS traffic, cannot be blocked in a network. If you, if you, if your uh, network administrator or your systems administrator, your sysadmin, blocks the DNS traffic in your network uh, with the idea of preventing threats and preventing the compromised devices from contacting their command and control server, what's going to happen is that all the users in that network will think that they don't have internet connectivity. Because their devices won't be able to reach the IP addresses that they need to reach. So if I, if I want to reach utilize the com.ua 
and I go to the browser and type www.eurojust.com .ua, um, and the DNS port, which is the channel that the DNS uses for its traffic, is blocked. My device won't know what IP address to connect to to download that content that I'm modding that I need to to to, to visit or to view or to read or whatever. So it cannot be blocked. And it can be redirected in the internal network. That means, to put it in a, in a simple way, say the DNS traffic comes through this window, that window would be port 53. Um, the engineer in the internal network can have all that traffic flow internally through port whatever, uh, 40,000, 30,000. There's from port one to 65 something thousand, I don't remember the, the exact amount. He can make that redirection, um, but usually they don't, because he can have implications, uh, and if they're not savvy at DNS things, it, it, it can give them a nightmare on the company as well. So they usually don't do that redirection, which means that it's a perfect line of communication that will not be interrupted, that will not be filtered, that will not be blocked. Um, and in which there's always traffic. Traffic is expected to that port, to that channel of communication. Um, so it's perfect. Um, and, and the traffic that goes to that channel, to that port, to be more specific, um, is expected. What you would see when you analyze traffic on port 53, which is this DNS channel, is DNS queries and DNS responses. We, we can see some examples later on of how DNS query loops and how our response looks like. Um, that's expected, of course, that's what's supposed to be in there. And if you go and see what's going back and forth to that port, all you'll see are queries and responses. You won't see encrypted traffic, which would be weird and would trigger an alarm, um, because that's not a port through which any encrypted traffic should be going in and out. Um, so it goes unnoticed for the most part. So there are some ways that people can use, and I'll mention those and just keep those in mind because it might be interesting for you to consider certain implementations or at least uh, get curious about those and read a little bit about those to inform yourselves and see if you can. If it's worth implementing depending on, on, on the, 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 the security practices and policies that you have implemented or may be interested in implementing in your business. Um, but if there are no, if there are no such uh, measures implemented, no one's going to see that something's going on. So the criminals, for some time already, for a few years, have been registering domains for the command and control of their buttons. That's one malicious use of domain names. We'll see some, some pretty specific examples in a minute. Other types of malicious use of domain names are, well, this is just a screenshot of th this guy, Evgeny, um, one of the botnets that he, that he was operating, that his criminal organization was operating back then, was CryptoLocker, which is like the grand, 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 grandfather of some of the ransomware types that are out there today. This is just a screenshot of one of the pop-ups that the victims would see when CryptoLocker um, compromised their devices. And then, the, I, I, I always show this, this screenshot as well, because it's not something um, better, it's something that causes debate. Um, this is illegal pharma. And when I say illegal pharma, I know that a possible question that may come from the audience is, illegal in what jurisdiction? Illegal in what country? So, well, it depends, of course. But, and then, of course, there are arguments on both sides. Um, on, on, on one hand, you have the, the like the formal, how, how to say, like the law enforcement and pharmaceutical company side uh, that you can maybe even extend to public safety, um, in which they say that those uh, medicines that are sold via uh, illegal pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical domains, uh, that those medicines Maybe simple counterfeit products that have nothing of the 
the active ingredient there. Um, they may have some poisons instead, or they have less active principle or more active principle. Um, and of course, if you talk to the DEA agents from the Drug Enforcement Administration that deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis, they will share uh, more than one case of uh, people that have died because of purchasing these medicines through the legal pharma. But then on the other side, you have those people that have limited resources like we all do because we don't have an infinite wallet. Um, that have illnesses um, and need access to medicines at lower prices. So that, that's a human uh, situation that one has to understand as well. Um, but then it gets more complicated because you, you have that tension between those two positions. Um, add another element to that. Some years ago, there was a criminal organization operating out of a country in Asia that used between 5,000 to 7,000 illegal pharma domains to obtain the funds that they used to buy and sell weapons to a terrorist organization. So what you saw on the surface, like what the sailors in the Titanic saw that little bit, which is the sale, the sale of medicines. Yeah, well, let's take them down. Uh, it's bad for the companies. It, it can be true that it puts people at risk if they happen to purchase counterfeit products, um, but then add that element in there. So the people that bought medicines from those domains ended up uh, providing funds for the, the, the trade, arms trade, to a very, very nasty and bad terrorist organization. So there's more to things than one would, that what one would think. This is a very specific um, example or case. It's that this one, we, we talk about it uh, because it's very relevant. Late 2008, uh, Conficker, it was a botnet, a malware type that um, was first detected by Penn um, and it became uh, relevant almost immediately. Uh, why? Because it was a nightmare. It was, from the operational security standpoint, it was a nightmare. Um, it was registering, at one point, it got to have up to 15 million compromised devices in many countries, and the criminals, uh, they they must have taken like a time travel kilo or something, because they um, used techniques that hadn't really been used back then. They, for the first time, um, these, that's called DGAs, were used. What are these? Domain generation algorithms. What does it mean? that the malware itself has lines of code that will allow the botnet itself without human intervention to create domain names. So the criminal doesn't even have to go himself and register the domain names. The botnet will do it for himself. And how does it do it? It's just a mathematical function that creates strings. If you look at them, they seem to be random, randomly generated. Well, now it's a mathematical function. Um, and Conficker was registering at one point more than 500 domains per day across more than 100 TLDs. And why did the criminals need so many domain names? Because they were making a lot of money. And they didn't want to lose control of their infrastructure. So by having all those domain names available, they were making sure that their botnet was going to continue to be resilient and stable. So basically, the suckers were following the same mantra as we did. They were technically very good. That, that's their credit. They were really good at what they were doing. So DJAs, the main generation algorithms. When you are, um, when you have your uh, 
systems engineer monitoring the traffic, the DNS traffic inside your organization, and you have set up certain rules, you will be able to see whenever there's a device within your network that sends DNS queries to DGA domains. Engineers and the guys that know how to write scripts can write certain rules that will trigger alerts. And when you when you see domain names that are what, what what's called non mnemonic non mnemonic uh, names, which means not a name that's intended to be for human use, for human consumption, if you want, because it's 24, 32, 64 characters, alphanumeric or numeric or alpha only, whatever the criminal chose. Those are not intended for human consumption. So whenever a string as such is seen in the network in the within the DNS traffic, an alert can be raised and the security team can go and respond. And if they go in and respond, they can disconnect the compromised device from the network, they can run forensics on it, they can find the, 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 the malware type that compromised the device, they can clean it. Um, if they identify the malware type, then they will be able to, to um, also uh, scan the entire network and see if they have been compromised elsewhere. Um, and it's, 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 it's just amazing. Just with the malware sample, just by finding out which is the malware type that compromised that device, they will be able, if they go one step deeper, they will be able to discover all the infrastructure that's associated with that campaign. Um, and why would you want to do that? Why, if you're not James Bond or if you're not a police officer, because you'll want to protect your network. So your device was already compromised and it sends a DNS query to a domain, a particular domain. There are this many other domains that are associated with the same button. It's likely that any other device in your network is compromised and you just can't see it. So why not block all of those domains at your router? Or why not create, um, yeah, it can be at the router and the firewall, it, it, it depends on the implementation. Or at the DNS, if you have your own re resolution server, right? if you have internally your own server, that, that's for the users, for the employees, to access DNS information, you can put it there in that server as well. So it, it depends on how you want it to look like. But you can use that information to protect yourself. Configure um, was in 2013 the most active banking trojan, and the criminals behind it made a lot of money uh, by stealing user credentials to financial service websites. Uh, so banks and uh, so they uh, wiped out people's money from their bank accounts and their savings accounts. Um, and as we'll see as well with uh, Game Over Zeus, um, they, in a criminal, compromises devices and get, puts a button together, um, then they can lease that space. They can lease those compromised devices for other criminals to use it um, and also inject their own malware type and um, do whatever nasty things they want to do. Um, so, uh, Conficker used, um, I think, this, I made a mistake in this, because this part is related to another, this is not Conficker, the, the title is wrong. This is CryptoLocker and Game Over's use. Remember this guy here? This is what he did, so let me correct it on the fly. Uh, that's compromised devices. 
and then find the result this might have been a gap in which uh, what the security community was doing, um, and it's a technique that's widely used by law enforcement and people that are doing security research, is that when you register a domain name, say I register colors.com, I have to define a server that's going to provide you, the whole world, with the addresses of my website, of my mail server, of my FTP server. That's called a name server. So when, when I operate a name server, I will see all the IP addresses uh, that correspond to the devices that are asking for that information. So if I am operating the name servers for CNN.com, I will see all the IP addresses that are asking for the IP address for the website at CNN.com. All of them. Also, I, I will see them. So why do law enforcement and the folks in the security research side um, I didn't even sign and I was already asked my question. What they do is that they, uh, via different means, they operate those name servers. They have those name servers who face via court orders or via voluntary cooperation, those name servers get replaced so that if the criminal domain is criminal.com and the name server for that criminal domain is ms.criminal.com, the police or the security researcher obtain the change or the replacement of that name server to another one that they operate. So instead of ns.criminal.com, it would be their own name server, which would be ns.police.com or ns.security.com or whatever. Why? Because if just as if, as I was saying, if I operate the name servers for CNN.com, I will see the IP addresses of all the devices worldwide that are uh, asking for that IP address. Well, but how? For example, if any users use uh, Google DNS, Google sees Google DNS asking about this, but you can see it's an endpoint user device. You can see only Google asking for your queries. You, you can see only a little part of uh, because that's, users. That's, that's a recursive server. Yes, uh, that's a recursive server. Recursive servers. Well, what, what he's mentioning is a, is a set of servers that are distributed um, and that are operated in basically every country that are operated by third parties. The ISPs run those servers. Those servers ask questions for their customers, for their users. Um, so the way it works with those servers is that um, you send a question to that server, that server obtains the answer from the authoritative server, and with that answer then they update their own temporary uh, memory and pass the response to the user. Um, in those cases, yes, uh, you would only see the address of the recursive resolver, but you will still see all the responses that may be coming from users who are not using recursive resolvers. Um, that technique is called SIM coding, um, and it's used for uh, mitigation and remediation. Um, by controlling the name servers, they have visibility of the compromised devices. They identify all the ISPs that have been compromised and that are um, um, that are sending queries asking for the criminal domain names. And once it, it's like what happened with uh, Avalanche um, and another very bad type of model that uh, was taken down in 2012 that was called DNS changer. Um, they, once they have the big uh, bucket of IP addresses, they can separate them per country. Um, of course, you can, you can see that information. You can see which IP address has been allocated to which ISP by the regional organization that does that. Um, and then you can see which ISP uh, received that uh, that identifier, that IP number, um, and if you have the ISP name, then you won't have the contact information. So the national search, which are the computer emergency response teams, received the information uh, for the IP address that were compromised with those types of malware, and they were asked with engaging with the ISPs to seek uh, user remediation. That means the national search talked, knocked on the door of the ISPs, 
said, we have this set of IP addresses, these are yours. We saw these IP addresses sending queries uh, asking for uh, uh, the command and control server of this manual type. So your users, these users of yours are compromised. Uh, please talk to them, help them think, clean it up. And th those types of awareness complaints are done all the time uh, by the search, uh, starting with the US search, etc. So did I answer your question? Some of them? Yeah. So um, this, this drop may have been a hiccup in, in the name servers that their security researchers were uh, using to observe the, the compromised device uh, traffic. That may have been a hiccup. It, it, it might have uh, stopped working very uh, briefly for a period of some hours, and that, that, that's what I would think. This is um, compromised device traffic. So, what that guy, Evgeny, um, was doing, and again, all his uh, operation was being facilitated by the registration and operation of domain names, was that he was relying on infrastructure of another botnet that is called Cutwell. It, it, it still exists. There are variants of Cutwell that are still live out there. Um, so basically, he paid a fee to the, the GAN that was operating the Cutwell botnet um, so that they would let him use those compromised bots, those compromised devices to inject um, uh, game over juice. Um, and once he had injected game over juice, then they would also inject crypto load. So the, the scenario for the victims was really bad because their, their devices uh, were being used to launch attacks against third parties. So their bandwidth was degraded. Say you are um, a company, um, you need your bandwidth to stay uh, super stable because you have uh, conference calls all the time. You have to be, uh, you're, I don't know, you're in the music business, uh, you're in the movie industry, you need to be downloading and uploading very large files all the time. You need the bandwidth to always be stable and be up. And suddenly you see, and things start going wrong. So, well, that's what started happening to, to victims that had all these big scheme um, of compromises in their, in their devices. And why does their bandwidth get downgraded or degraded better? Because they're being used to send attacks. Uh, they're being used as part of uh, denial of service attacks against someone else. Then they sold their access credentials to financial service websites. And then they um, encrypted their relevant files, asking for a ransom to be paid via some cryptocurrency. So it was a pretty bad scenario for the victims. Then I'll, I'll, I'll show later on um, how the DNS is also used as an espionage tool. Uh, in particular, the game over use Aside from being um, that banking program, it was also used to exfiltrate information and was used as part of espionage campaigns, like state-sponsored espionage campaigns. Um, that happens at the corporate level as well. I'll, I'll show you just a conceptual example of, of how it can happen. Um, and it does happen, and it's very hard to notice. Another specific example of, um, of a threat that involved massive use of domain names was Avalanche. Avalanche was the malware business taken to the most sophisticated state that you can ever imagine. Now, it was botnet. Um, Basically, in, in marketing speech, it would be, we provide you with the cloud experience. So come to us, you don't worry about anything. So all you have to do if you were uh, um, a user or a customer for, for the guys that run the Avalanche platform, 
was you had to log into our website, into a platform. There you could choose the malware type that you wanted to launch against your victims. They offered 20 different malware uh, types. Then they registered the domain names for you uh, for both the distribution of the, of, the, of the malware to your victims for the spamming campaign that preceded the actual uh, compromise. Also, the command and control domains. They operated the name servers for those malicious domains. Um, and they offered the hosting for, um, for the websites that were, being, that were being used to spread the malware. Um, they used a, a nasty technique that makes investigations very complicated that I'm not going to explain because it's, it's a little techy. It's called double fast clocks, which basically means that IP addresses jump all the time, every minute, every two minutes, every three minutes. And they did it on both the name resolution as well as on the hosting side. So the name, the name servers would be changing all the time. And then the, the servers for the content with the model was stored and was being distributed to the world were changing every two minutes, every three minutes. So how can you have a police officer or some researcher find where the bloody servers are if they're changing every two minutes? That investigation took from 2009 uh, until December of last year. It was too complex. So we evolved from, from a, a regular botnet to a whole malware delivery service. It provided bulletproof, bulletproof services using that double fast logs technique. It was predominantly used for financial attacks, uh, mostly Trojan bankings. Provided that cloud customer experience, managed the criminal domain registrations. So the customer didn't really have to worry about anything. They didn't have to register the domain names. They didn't have to deal with the malware directly themselves. It was all being offered to them on the cloud. They had access to command and control servers and assets. Some of the uh, malware families that were being offered through Avalanche. Avalanche used um, as most, yeah, most not all, but most malware families nowadays use also uh, those algorithmically generated domain names. These are some samples. In this case, it's only alphabetic characters, uh, but it can be any combination of, of any length. Um, and these were, these were all the TLDs that Avalanche was registering domains within. Uh, uh, so for takedown purposes, this is complicated because it requires a lot of coordination. Just like with Configure, uh, that were uh, more than 100 TLDs were being used for the registration of the command and control names. Um, this requires a lot of coordination. And the reason why that coordination is so important and why I repeat that part is because when the, the law enforcement operation is going to happen, when the takedown is going to happen, everything has to go down at the same time. The entire infrastructure has to be taken away from the, from the criminal's hands, because if not, if only one, uh, what's the right word there? If only one domain name that's live, that's being currently used for command and control of the button, stays live, they can use it to update the code, and change the algorithm. And then the whole operation goes to hell, basically. Um, so, this is the, the rifle with which the, the criminal, the alleged criminal, uh, is still, the criminal process against him is still ongoing. Um, so, I can't mention his name because he's still ongoing. But this is him trying to escape from the from the police during the operation. This is the rifle with which he welcomed the police officers. And these are some Ukrainian alien forces trying to get to the guy and arrest him. And they did arrest him. They found seventy thousand dollars, which wasn't that much. The rest was probably who knows where. Uh, but that, that's at least in the case the rent 
for a year, like this. As an interesting note, it's not here, but as an interesting note, 830,000 domains uh, were addressed during that police operation. Uh, some of those domains already existed, and they either were suspended. When a domain gets suspended, it means that it doesn't work anymore. There's no web, there's no email, there's no FTP, there's nothing. Um, you may see that it's still registered, uh, and if you, if you look for the registration information, you may still get a response saying, yes, the domain exists, and this is the information of the person who registered that domain. But if you don't try to actually technically operate with that domain or interact with that domain, you won't be able to, because it is excluded from the DNS. Technically, the expression is that it is uh, excluded from the zone file of the TLD. So the, the a TLD zone file is basically all the neighborhood within that TLD. It's all the domains that are within that TLD. So for that com, uh, the zone file includes all the second level domains, all the domains that exist within that com. When a domain gets suspended, that domain gets excluded of that list, and it won't work anymore. So some of those domains were suspended. Um, some other domains were simple. The same following was what I was mentioning a bit ago, uh, and you can have the name server changed. And remember, the name servers allow you to see devices that are querying, that are asking for the criminal uh, domain name. Um, so that Europol and the German police and the FBI uh, could identify compromised devices and start a mitigation and remediation campaign with the victims of, of all the malware types that were distributed through Avalanche. And uh, those domains that didn't exist, because the cool thing about the, the DGAs, about the domain generation algorithms, is that they're just mathematical functions. You don't even need a sample of the malware to figure out that algorithm. Uh, some guys that are too brilliant, far more brilliant than I am, now, only by looking at the previous registrations uh, that correspond to a particular malware type, they are able to um, decipher that algorithm with 100% certainty, with 100% um, uh, certainty that that mathematical function that they decipher will register all the domains that that bucket will use in the future with no ending time, because it's just a mathematical function. So you just, you just let it run, and it can still be running in 500 years. Um, so those domains that will be registered in the future by the botnet um, get included in lists that won't allow them to ever come to life, basically. Those, they, those, lists, those lists are given different names, uh, but from a, like a, a general uh, perspective, we can call them reserved lists. Each operator of a TLD has its own list of domains that will never be created. So they get included there, and those domains will never exist. And the result is that the criminals lose control of their infrastructure. They can it. Now they have it. One minute later, the operation took place. Now they don't have control. Um, so it's, it's of course, uh, the best scenario when you take it away from the criminal hands. <clears throat> now the DNS is a vector. Uh, why do you use several separate algorithms for uh, calculating these domain names? For example, uh, one request every one hour, or the second one in months. And then you when you walk uh, the alerts which generate the names uh, once a day in a month uh, they can uh, take control of what we start that again and if uh, even you understand the algorithm of the second uh, level they can use third whole level of the generation and uh, uh, how I reach they uh, take it back this uh, this is this you work, no, not, not in code, but first level mm. of the <coughs> algorithm, but after that, they take that come back with the second mm -hmm. high level. His point is very interesting. Why don't criminal use two algorithms for uh, added resilience to their balance? 
I think they haven't figured out. Or I, I don't know the reason, but they're not doing it. And thank God they're not doing it. Because that would be a nightmare. That would be like, oh my God, we're dead. Like, mm, it's going to be so much more complicated now uh, if they started doing it. Because then um, you would probably, the, the researchers would only probably would only find out about that second algorithm after the first operation has taken place. Because the way the way it works is that um, those command and control domain names get suspended all the time. Uh, the, the security community uh, sees the domains and they start processes with the companies that offer the registration of that domain name. Um, that, that company may be willing to suspend it and suspend it. Um, so when the compromised device tries to connect with that domain and there's no response, then the code itself uh, sends a note, a note uh, to his master, to its master, saying, whoops, this domain is down, and then the button creates another one immediately. This is, of course, a very simplified way of how it works. So in a similar fashion, if you suspended all the domains um, or prevented or uh, prevented the creation of all the domains that a botnet's going to use, and the botnet is not able to communicate with any of those domains. Uh, only then would that second algorithm come and, and get turned on. Um, I imagine, of course, you can have it implemented as 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 you want. But that that would be the logical thing for me to to do if I was the the criminal. Um, so then you would have to, uh, as the as people say in English, wash rinse. Start again. See the new trend of registrations that will follow that second algorithm, decipher it, and repeat the operation. So let's hope they don't start doing doing it. Now here, this is a, a simple visualization of a um, a denial distributed denial denial. I need, I need code, code. Distributed denial of service attack. Yes. There's no part kind that book for that portion. I tried the, at the time, I tried the, the I, I don't know the name, I won't even try to pronounce it, the part that it has horseradish in it. It's strange to me, it's a new flavor. It is good. Yeah. I'm gonna have some more before I leave. Um, so this is a, a DDoS attack that uses the DNS. Um, ISPs are here, they are operating the service that he was referring to. Those are um, known as recursive resolvers. This is my device. I hope those in the back can see. Can you guys see? Yeah. I want to visit a domain name, any domain name. Either my device already has that information in a file that you should call the host's file. If it has that information, it will simply take me there. It will resolve. And that information is the IP address for the website that I want to visit. If it doesn't have the information, it has to obtain it from somewhere. So it goes and asks a name server. This a recursive server. That recursive server is uh, those servers that I was mentioning that are operated by the ISPs, by the companies that provide you with internet access. In a similar situation, these servers may already have that information in their temporary memory, in their cache memory. If they do, they pass the response back down. This device updates its little file, the host's file, and includes that entry there, and results and takes me to the website. If it doesn't have that information, it has to go somewhere. This 
this is it's oversimplifying the process, but it's just to, to make it shorter and simpler to understand. The recursive resolver in this simplified version uh, sends a query first to the root. Um, the, the, the DNS from an operational standpoint um, is, is, is a hierarchical structure. Um, on the top, there's the root. And the root is basically a, a, a system that's comprised of 13 servers uh, that have names. Uh, their names go from A to N, and each of those is operated by different organizations. I can operate one of them, uh, RIPE NCC, which is an organization that some of you may have heard. Uh, in the Netherlands, they, they provide uh, Europe and I think North Africa as well, and the Middle East with IP addresses, basically. But they operate K, I think, and the University of Southern California operates B, and so on. Um, the root, and those 13 servers are, are, of course, not just 13 machines. Each of those letters, each of those servers is a, a cluster of instances that are distributed to graphics. But all that's in the root is the information for the top level domains. So the root has no idea of how to take, of, of what's the IP address for the website that I want to visit. Say I want to visit www.icand.org. What will be the response, the first response that this server will receive? You need to go ask the .org servers. So this guy goes up and asks the Lord. However, the only thing that the Lord sees is the domains that have been created within the Lord. So the Lord doesn't know where www.icand.org is. What this sees only is the second level, which is icand.org. This bit after the first time. Now, this .org server response it says, "I know who has the information that you need. That's going to be the server for icand.org, because that's the only place where we can obtain uh, the authoritative information uh, regarding the IP address for W's that icand.org." So. This one goes and asks icand.org and then it gets the IP address for the website. <coughs> then this server, remember this is the, the server that's operated by the ISP, that's the company that provides you with internet access updates its memory and follows the same process. Passes the response down to my device, which in its turn updates its host file and then resolves. These guys here have a role that not all of them have realized. And, and somehow, but for different reasons, um, um, I have to be politically correct. <laughs> is there any ISP among you? Is there anyone here who works for an ISP? For a company that provides internet access to the public? No? Okay. Um, no, just in case, so that I use appropriate words. <laughs> there are techniques that, these, that the ISPs can implement for the operation of, of their servers, their recursive servers servers that may help prevent this from happening. The way these attacks happen is that um, there are two vectors. It's, I didn't mention it here, but it's, these attacks use two vectors, amplification and reflection. What does reflection mean? Say I want to attack all that server. My IP address is 3.3.3.3. Her IP address is 6.6.6.6. .6 .6 .6. I sent 
DNS queries asking for whatever name, it doesn't matter. And in the data package, remember that all the traffic that goes, that gets routed on the internet, is data packets. And in TCP, those data packets identify the IP address where they're coming from. Um, so that DNS query is a little packet, and it's telling that server who sent the query. Because that's the only way this server is going to be able to send an answer to whoever, whomever asked the question. What I will do is that I will exactly falsify that IP address. And instead of mine, I will include Olga's. And I will not only use this ISP server, but I will use tens of thousands of servers that, that have another issue that I'll talk about in a minute when I get there. Um, and I'm going to use a large network of compromised devices to send DNS queries to all those tens of thousands of servers that are accepting those queries. And all of them per second are going to send tons of bytes to all that. And her server is going to get knocked down. It will be very hard for her not to uh, have her server like, fall. There will necessarily be uh, uh, an anti ddos protection service in place before the attack begins. Um, and if not, then you will have to pay big money to get in one of those uh, uh, anti ddos protection services, which if the attack's already happening, of course, you're going to have to pay much more. So, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Several last years, almost anyone would use yeah, that's really good for example, DNS is somewhat faster than So I haven't seen the DNS stuff more than two or three years. Mm -hmm. They still do the DNS for that. There's the DNS still, he's saying that he hasn't seen DNS. The DNS being used as a vector in the task. It's still being used as a vector. It's not the only vector that's used. It'd be silly to say so but it's still being used. Um, the last time that it was notoriously used, um, like notoriously that had, um, uh, it was a big incident, wasn't the attack against a French company, OVH, last year, and against Brian Krebs, he's a, a security blogger, and against a, security, a DNS company that's called Dyn DNS. Uh, the attackers uh, used several vectors, one of which was the DNS, along with other protocols. Um, but it's still being used. Um, and, and you can see attack traffic from different research groups showing the different protocols that are being used in the attacks, and you can still see the genus traffic going back and forth in those attacks. Um, so you can, you can fake the source address and direct all those DNS responses to the victim. Um, the ISPs could prevent those uh, data packets with the fake IP address from passing on after the router. They could prevent those packets from going out, um, but they don't. And those, those, the, the way for preventing those uh, from getting routed out to the internet, uh, those techniques have been known uh, since '97. The first, there are some documents that are called RFPs, the RFCs, Request for Comments. Those are developed by the internet community and those are basically uh, standardized and agreed upon uh, ways of addressing different technical things that have to do with the operation of the internet or a protocol or what have you. Um, this is called source address validation and it's known. It, it, and there are two uh, like known documents that talk about this in case anyone is technical enough and gets interested about this. It's BCP38 and BCK84. If anyone happens to be interested, um, just look them up. There's a lot of information about them since 98. In 97 when the first RFC came. And this is still happening because the ISPs are not willing to implement these things. And then the other thing, and that's with regards to the filtering of the, of the source addresses. Um, and then the other thing that the ISPs could do but are not necessarily doing is um, 
they are croquet operation of those recursive resolvers that they provide for their customers. <laughs> um, what I mean by this is, is that um, while there are servers such as the one that he was mentioning, Google has a server that's at a that a that a that a um, that's a DNS server that anyone can use uh, for uh, the resolution of the names in their device. Uh, it's public. Um, anyone from anywhere in the world can send queries to that to that server. Uh, that domain and that server and uh, other services like that, like OpenDNS, UltraDNS, those are really well managed. And they have implemented something that's called rate limiting policies that would prevent attackers from abusing those services. The thing is that many ISPs have their, uh, their recursive servers uh, open for anyone to query them. So in, in, imagine if I am an ISP and this is the range of IP addresses that I, that I received from, in, in your case, in Bright NCC, then in an ideal, at least in a conceptual scenario, um, my DNS server, my name, my recursive server would only respond DNS queries received from these guys, from the users that have received IP addresses within the range, and that I know that I gave this user this IP address this day at that hour, and it's this user, etc. Um, that's an ideal scenario. It's probably not the most realistic, but it's at least from a conceptual perspective, it's the ideal scenario. Well, they don't do this. They let those servers, they leave those servers open, and anyone can query them. And those, and, and they don't implement any sort of rate limiting. And that means that they won't stop the servers from providing responses regardless of the amount of queries that they receive per IP address. So if you if you query Google's recursive server and you send, I'm gonna make up any number. If you send more than a thousand queries per minute from your IP address, Google's gonna block you. You're not gonna get any more responses. And I just made that number up. I, I have no idea of what the rate limiting policy for Google is. Uh, it can be any number. Um, They, these guys don't have any rate limiting. So it's a vector um, that criminals use. You see, it's what allows them, in combination with a lot of filtering of the source addresses, it's what allows them to use the DNS to direct the tags using the DNS as a vector. And then by using commands, um, specific commands through which one can obtain information from the DNS. They can specify certain parameters um, that add the amplification layer to the attack. So while the query to the DNS can be whatever, seven, seven K, seven bytes, it's just a, a small uh, line of text. The response can be 2.5, 2.7 megabytes. So it's multiplied. Uh, more than a thousand times the size of the responses compared to the size of the query. So multiply that by the hundreds of thousands of compromised devices that may be part of the botnet, multiply that by all the tens of thousands of, of open resolvers that are out there. But there's a project that's run by a researcher, uh, his name is Jared Mao, uh, and he, he's constantly querying the entire IPv4 space looking for open resolvers. In other words, he's always sending DNS queries to all the IPv4 addresses, all, all of them, um, and trying to see if he gets a response. Um, and he does it in a way that he can find out which are open resolvers and which are not. And it's identified, I don't know how many there are right now. Last time I checked, it was around 36,000, which is a huge number. So it's 36 thousand servers that are ready to be used um, in amplification and uh, use reflection attacks using the DNS. How much time do we have? So I mentioned the attack against OVH. 
Um, I don't have it here, but uh, the, the CEO of that company uh, did some, of course, in the, in the investigation and in the response um, uh, uh, that they had to come up with uh, to respond to that attack. They were able to find out that uh, the attack was coming from 146,000 video cameras that were connected to the internet. Um, and that that small amount of video cameras had the potential of launching a uh, never before seen DDoS attack that was able to reach 1.5 terabytes per second, which is inhuman. Like, it's, it, we can't compute that amount of data here. Um, you know, the way the, the like on a, on a local or regional. Sorry, what is OVH? OVH, I don't know, it's an acronym. It's the name of the company. I just know them as OVH, but I don't know. Now, that might have to do with the guy's name because his name is Octav, but I forgot his last name. So it might be something related to his name. I don't know. If you remember how, um, I'm simplifying it, how the topology of the internet at a regional, at a geographically small uh, uh, space, how it works. The users receive internet connectivity through an ISP. These points here are the ISPs. These are the ISPs. ISPs connect through IPX, these internet exchange points. That in turn are providing routing for uh, ISPs in their own region. Each, each of these guys, each of these ISPs, in average, um, is able to, to route between 10 and 100 gigas per second. That's in average. The first attack that was seen in 2013, making massive use of the DNS um, as, as a vector, uh, reached 300, more than three, like 330, 337, I think, gigabytes against Spam House. Uh, Spam House is a, a research group that does cool things. Um, that is three times more than the average ISP can, can sustain. This attack had the potential of sending 1.5 terabytes. The actual traffic that was observed during this attack was 1.1 terabytes which is still several times more than what these guys in our are able to route. So these attacks are concerning. And remember this one was facilitated by the use of video cameras. That's IoT. And um, to add to the complexity of those uh, recursive servers that the ISPs are uh, managing in ways that could be improved. Now, your refrigerator, your microwave oven, your car, uh, your light bulb, if they are connected to the internet, um, I don't want to make an unfair generalization, uh, but there's a slight chance that at some point a criminal uh, compromises them and uh, start, starts using them as DNS servers. Uh, many IoT devices are being seen uh, sending DNS traffic and receiving DNS traffic. So it only adds more complication. Uh, that's why I added this. Are we approaching the end of the internet? No, no, it's not that bad. <laughs> uh, people in the security community, well, there are all sorts of things, and by things I mean weird and funny people within the security community. There are some that are very apocalyptic, but there are some that are some that are more like on the on the light side of things. 
if you have someone who's more on their apocalyptic paradigm, their apocalyptic view, then they'll say, oh yeah, we're doomed, this is going to hell, it's just a matter of time before something more like that happens, and people lose their lives, blah, 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 blah. Let's hope it doesn't happen. Let's hope it doesn't happen. Let's have faith in human kind. Um, but yeah, let, let's just say this is something to keep an eye on. And U.S. businesses um, uh, have to be ready. And U.S. businesses have to be sure of what's going through your networks. And you should you should do your your job. You should do your due diligence in protecting your assets. Um, you have resources. You have systems that have a lot of uh, hard drive space. You have networks that have a lot of bandwidth, and those assets are wanted by the criminals. To damage you, of course, but also to damage other people. And because people don't realize and don't don't protect their, their networks well enough, the internet is basically polluted to it. If you analyze a snapshot of the internet traffic at any point in time, you will see that most of it is food traffic. It's traffic that's not coming from where it claims to come from. Because it's being sent by someone who doesn't want others to know that it was him or her um, pretending or hoping to do something that may not be super legitimate or legal in every jurisdiction. So keep that in mind. It's also a matter of good digital citizenship to protect one's own assets. Um, aside, of course, from the from the from the business perspective of uh, creating and implementing a, a sound and strong uh, information security policy. Uh, aside from that, which is obvious and it's just uh, should be part of the business, uh, but it's also good digital citizenship. Another view of the DNS being um, used for bad things um, there's a lot to talk about. This is my device. These are routers. Any one of these can be a router. This can be my ISP server. All of them can get compromised, and many of them actually do get compromised by criminals who want to redirect the criminal's traffic um, so that they can steal user credentials, so that they can um, inject malware, so that they can uh, replace the, the ads, the publicity ads that are displayed in the website content. Um, and it just happens every day. There's there's a website that's um, operated by by a Mexican company. They call themselves a security company, but uh, I, I wouldn't have the the guts to call myself that. Um, they run uh, within the things that they do. They offer um, a page with all the uh, links to exploits for basically. All the known brands of routers for as many models as, as you want. And with that, with all those things, you can actually access the exploits, how to use the exploits, um, with instructions. Very easy to learn how to do that. And with that, what you can do is basically, um, if you're interested in learning about what your business competitor is doing, you can um, compromise the router. And if you compromise the router, you can do a lot of that. From changing the DNS configuration to other different nasty things. And it's all facilitated at this point. And among the things that they do is they offer exploits uh, that allow to change the DNS configuration. And it's just one example. It's one silly, silly example. So each device. Ah, man, I didn't want to show this yet. <laughs> ah, still in me, I, uh, I didn't want to show it right now. I forgot. <laughs> That's going to be a surprise. 
Okay. Anyway. Um, so I've been talking about uh, uh, the recursive servers that each device sends the DNS queries to. Um, this, this server here has an IP address. That IP address is defined here in my device. So there's somewhere here in my device where I can write down or my ISP can provide that IP address, which is the address of that server that, that where the DNS queries will go to. If they change it, if they change that IP address, or that IP address is changed at the router level, say if my company's router is for the domain resolution happens and they change that IP address, then it's called hijacking. Because they they stole my DNS configuration and they put their the address of the criminal server that they are operating. And what, what happens when, when my DNS configuration gets hijacked? That all my queries are going to go to a criminal server so that the criminals will provide me with the answers that they want. So if I want to visit CNN.com and my DNS configuration has been hijacked, the criminals will be able to send me 6.6.6.6, which will be the IP address for their own server that will provide me with the same content that I will find in the actual CNN.com website, um, only that's coming through them. It's going to be a real-time copy. Um, they may be replacing the publicity ads. They may be serving malware. If it's uh, the website of your bank, they may be capturing and stealing your traffic. Um, it allows them to even stand in the middle, um, uh, meaning if you send email, they may be able to see that email coming in and we send it so that no one notices that they saw the email that you were sending and that you were receiving. You wouldn't even notice. You sent the email and the other person received it. There was someone in the middle reading. You didn't, you had no idea, nothing happened, but there was someone in the middle. All those things are facilitated by these hijacking. And then there's poisoning. Uh, poisoning means, um, remember that I mentioned that there are two temporary memories. Once up here, the cache memory of the recursive server, and down here in my device, the host file. That those store for a defined period of time the associations between domain names recently queried that, that time frame is defined per domain name, the administrator of the domain name defines that time frame, and the corresponding IP addresses. So if here in my host's file they change the IP address instead of 1.1.1.1, they add 6.6.6.6. Whenever I want to visit cnn.com, I will go to their website, which will be the same real-time copy of the legitimate cnn.com. And I will not be able to realize because I will see in the browser, up in the, in the bar, I will see cnn.com. And it will be a cnn.com. Only that it's not the right server, the right web server. Uh, so it sucks. It's really bad. DNS compromises are really hard to detect. Because it's not something that the user is trained to, to, to see. And there really should be no expectation that the final user is uh, able to detect that they are being uh, victimized via one of these attacks. It's for the techies to implement their infrastructure in a way that prevents these things from happening. Starting from an appropriate level of protection of their assets, good anti-malware, good firewall, good routers, etc. All those things that are uh, default, that should happen by default, um, should be there in place. Now, um, the silly joke that I was going to make is that if, if, if you get your cache poisoned, then you're going to end up looking like these guys. Like really, really ugly. And there's more. So we talked about bounded command and control, we talked about malware distribution, phishing, DDoS um, attacks, uh, but there's more. I mentioned at the beginning that the traffic that goes through the 
the channel of communication that uses the DNS can't be blocked. And while it can be redirected, say the channel can be moved to another channel, it usually, it usually is not changed. It is not redirected. Um, so it's a, a perfect channel of communication for the criminals to use in order to exfiltrate uh, data. And how do they do it? Each TCP packet um, has what are known as relevant and less relevant bits. If you change the less relevant bits, uh, you will still have the same data packet. If it's a DNS query and you change the least relevant bits, it will still be the same DNS query, it will still be the same command that you are sending, it will still be using the parameter that you added to the command, it will still go to the host or the server that you wanted to ask. Um, and those least relevant bytes uh, don't really affect the nature of, or the essence of the packet that you can replace them. And where are those, where, where can those least relevant bytes be? In the, uh, it's not packaging, I'm forgetting, I have to work in Spanish, which is my first language, but I'm forgetting it in, in padding, in the padding. There's, there's padding because of the way the TCP packets are, are constructed or built. There's a padding with extra bits, oftentimes, uh, to, to conform to the standard that, that TCP packets have to follow. Those uh, bits in the padding can be replaced. Um, and it's just a waiting time. It's, it's a waiting game. The way they do it, and this, as I said, is just a conceptual example. This is like a simplified version of how they do it. Say that the, the adversary wants to exfiltrate the word icon from my network. So they would replace each of the letters for their corresponding ASCII decimal value. Multiply by 256. They obtain a new value. If you remember, everything that goes on the wire is zeros and ones. So uh, get the binary form of each of these values and get those from least, least, less, least uh, relevant bytes from each packet, extract the original ones and inject these ones and start sending out DNS queries with these new bytes there in the data packets. How does it form? All the criminal has to do is send a lot of DNS queries in a way that doesn't get noticed. So they time the query, they script, they program their malware so that it is sending uh, queries every 90, minutes, 90 seconds, every 80 seconds, every two minutes, whatever. Um, so that it doesn't raise a flag. If, if a compromised device started sending thousands of DNS queries, all of a sudden, then hey, hey you're compromised, so they have to turn you on. Basically, that, that's a red flag, of course. That's another in and of itself. Um, and as I said, it's unencrypted traffic, which would be weird, because that traffic is, is not meant to be encrypted. So it just flows out. And all the criminal has to do is sit and wait. And on the other end, the criminal server is receiving <laughs> those queries and is extracting those bits and putting them together until it is able to gather and recreate the packet um, or the information better that I was extra trade. So it's just a waiting game. They are not in a rush. Um, the only thing that they need is for their operation not to be um, identified. They just see and wait. How can you spot that your network is being uh, compromised? First, monitor and analyze the NS traffic in conjunction with some other uh, techniques. There's something that's called an RPZ firewall, response policy zone. Uh, firewall. What it does, there are there are several implementations. Um, I'll talk about two of them, like in general terms, the ones that actually exist. You can either there are paid paid for services, unfortunately, but at least they they exist. If if your network 
um, uh, has an element of criticality. It, it is uh, absolute, absolutely important um, uh, to make sure that you that you know when your network is compromised. And by the way, how many of you can better raise your hand um, if you are sure that your network is not compromised? <laughs> Yeah, no one can be sure. That's 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 that. Right. I'll have a drink with you guys tonight. Um, yeah, there's no way to know. So this you will find uh, issues uh, in the digital processor. So right now, no one can be sure that that's yeah. No, no, not only. As of now, but in general, you, you, you just can't be sure because there are so many new vulnerabilities. Uh, the bad guys are too good technically. Uh, the producers of the software and the hardware that we use are trying to catch up to what the bad guys are discovering. So it's, but anyway, um, what you do is that you point your DNS queries to a server that's operated by one of the security companies. Um, they, on their turn, receive feeds of information from groups that identify malicious domains. There's the operational security community is quite unknown and intentionally quite unknown. Um, there's no interest in, 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 in that community for it to be known, like in the media, it defeats the purpose. It's just good guys doing good work and identifying malicious infrastructure and preventing users from, from getting in touch or in contact with that infrastructure. Uh, so if a malicious campaign get a scamming campaign gets identified, usually that happens after four minutes after it started. Um, the, the, the researchers spot the domains that are being used for sending the spam email. They include them in blog lists. They also identify the IP addresses that are being used as part of the malicious infrastructure. They include them in different uh, block lists. They categorize the, the type of malicious use that the domains or the IP addresses are, um, are being seen in association with. Um, and, and there's not only one group, there are several groups or companies that do this type of analysis. Uh, they have monitors uh, distributed geographically. Um, and they see many different types of traffic, uh, botnet traffic, spamming traffic, phishing traffic. They see many things. And they identify the, the infrastructure, the bad guys, like those domains and those IP addresses. They include them in those lists. And the, remember, I was referring to your DNS queries being sent to one specific IP address, one specific server that's operated by a company that offers this that I was mentioning, that's called an RPC, RPZ, the response policy zone firewall. That server, that's basically a DNS server that on the one hand receives your queries, your questions to the DNS. So if Alexandra wants to ask for www.pocacola.com, that server will receive her query. And on the other hand, it, it is receiving those data feeds from those researchers. So it receives Alexandra's query, um, and it immediately crossed up, takes that domain and compares it to all the domains that are listed in the feeds that it is receiving. If there's no match, it will query and give her the response. And her device will take it to www.coca-cola.com or whatever. But if there's a match, it will mean that that domain has been recently seen in association with some form of this activity. And if there is a response, if, if, if there is a match, then the server will not only not respond, because if, if the server sends Alexandra's device, the answer then her device will communicate with the command and control server, and we don't want that, because then the criminal will know that he has a new compromised device that he can exploit. Um, but it will trigger an alert and let the system administrator know that there's a compromised device within the network, that the domain that was being queried for was this one, and that that domain has been seen in association with this type of malware. 
um, and of course that that triggers uh, responses uh, that correspond that would correspond to the information security policy that you of course have all implemented uh, very thoroughly and that are very sound and very deep and very well thought out. Uh, so you, you will also have a response time. You will know who needs to respond. Who's going to be the first responder? What that initial response will look like? Who will be involved in that response? Will it only be the, the systems engineer? Will it, will it involve legal? Will it involve PR, say public relations people? Uh, all those things have to be considered in, in, a, in, a, in an incidence response. Um, so that's one of those implementations where you send the queries to someone else's server. Um, that's checking against those feeds and then blocking the responses if there's a match with Oh my god, already. It's a pity. We have 10. Uh, we have 10. You can, we have 54 minutes, so just in case you want to get some questions. Okay. And then the last bit, no, not last bit. Well, I think we're going to stay here until 9. I am really sorry. <laughs> um, but anyway, conceptually, that's, that's a way for you to be able to know what's going on in your network. Just keep that in mind. Take take that home tonight. Whatever's going through your DNS channel in your network can tell you if there's something wrong. Just keep eyes on it. Talk to your systems engineer, to your network administrator, and see how you can implement something that has to do with it. Maybe you can use a DNS service that provides an, an added level of protection. Uh, I think uh, Symantec offers some sort of DNS resolution. I don't know how good it is. I honestly don't know. It may be really good, maybe a really bad. I have no idea. Uh, open DNS, close for DNS. They offer some added security, so so consider those things. Yeah, this this is the message. Monitor and analyze uh, port 53 tra traffic. Um, in case your your uh, the devices in your network become zombies that are part of a large botnet. And I included these two silly images here because the bots, the devices that get compromised and are part of a botnet are also known zombies. So you really need to know what to do when there's a zombie apocalypse in your internal network. Now, and how you can at least know when you are compromised. Monitor and analyze. Some countermeasures. This is something that we already talked about, source address validation and open resolvers. Uh, source address validation, ISP, ISPs, please filter the data packets that are falsifying their source IP address. Please filter them. And then open resolvers manage well their recursive servers that they are uh, offering for their customers. But this is more for you business people. For your companies. How about if you were, would, would you like the idea of sending, well, la launching a, a, a PR campaign uh, through which you would be informing your customers and the public at large, saying, because we care about you, we implemented security techniques that will prevent any criminal from using our domain uh, to fish you. Because we care. Something like that. Sounds nice, right? Well, we can implement this, and you will be able to launch that PR campaign. These techniques that are very simply put, it's information that's included in the DNS, allow you to prevent anyone from sending email pretending to come from your domain. It's not rocket science, although for us not techies, that's like rocket science, but for the techies, it's, it's not that complicated. Um, take it, take it home as well. Just write down SPF, DKIM, DMARC, and talk to your engineer or your manager, and at least discuss about it, about implementing these measures. Criminals will be able to use your domain names and send email pretending to you. And if you're a company and it's happened, I've seen. What's the word? Innumerable. Uh, 
She claims to know Spanish, <laughs> so she's, she's no, innumerable. Uh, okay, well, that is innumerable. Instances where uh, a company's clients get uh, 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 victimized because some criminal sent an email looking like the company's own domain and saying, hey, we have to send a wire transfer to this account uh, by today, blah, 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 pretending to be the CEO or the finance manager or something like that. You can't prevent that from happening. And that's going to happen sooner or later. And if you implement this part here, uh, then you will also be notified to receive a receiver report whenever your domain uh, is seen in, in spam email. Um, so just, as I said, take this home and think about them. Um, it's just measures that you can implement. They will not increase your the return on your investment. So let's be clear on that. They will, well, it, it, may, it may. If we are generous and think of the uh, increasing reputation and uh, client loyalty, and <laughs> uh, but it will not protect your assets. This doesn't protect your network. It's something that you can use to prevent more uh, polluting traffic to flow through the internet, and it's a way for you to protect your customers. Also. So it's it's interesting. So at least consider implementing it. And that's it. Do, do any one of you have any more questions or any comments or? Uh, so So the first thing that I said is that there are uh, brands, equipment brands like router brands that may make it more complicated for the HPs to implement these that I mentioned about filtering the, the data packets that can falsify the source IP address. That is true, but then there is also true that the technical community is there and they can find all the information and all the help that they want so that they can configure those devices in an appropriate way so that they can actually do that filtering. All sorts of comments and all sorts of uh, reasons why the ISPs don't want to do that implementation. I've heard everything. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a matter of uh, them actually taking the decision and moving forward with uh, with whatever for each step uh, uh, that's necessary for them to actually be able to the, to, to the implementation. Um, and then the other question is: I can create a domain name and point it to a name server that will provide any IP address. It can be someone else's IP address. Yes, it can. Then it, it can become operational. There's no reason to prevent that from happening. Um, and depending on what the activity, so what, 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 what can it look like? There was a Chinese attacker that not too long ago, about a year ago, I think or so, had a few domain names that if you visited them, you ended up going to I think Uh-huh. Like, who are you? So well, those were taken care of. Um, so depending on, on what the activity is, uh, you may be able to do different things. It can be phishing, uh, part of a larger, in and of itself, 
uh, it seems harmless, but it can be larger, part of a larger scheme, uh, a larger operation. So it really depends on what, on, on the rest of the contextual information about that uh, to be able to tell what you can do with that. Yeah. It, it's complicated. We, we have one user which wants to know my name, or in, uh, first of all, he or she uh, set up at uh, different sites, which, for example, broke in a different part, for example, Russia, China, and not is that uh, they point this uh, domain name to popular site as this company. For example, they uh, destroy about to 25% of mail traffic. They register the domain, which go to the firewalls in different operators. And I'm trying to understand they point to this domain to like address of mail and all users of Meru, for example, when they try going to Meru, but this is my name, close it by firewall. And this uh, user registers a lot of domains going to different popular domains in Russia, China, and different country, and uh, they don't uh, do nothing which uh, forgot this domain, because there are no rules which are provided to point to this IP. It's, it's, it's a very complicated thing to deal with, um, depending first on the TLD. Uh, so what, what can be done will depend, for example, in this case, it, it was under that group, it made the code that was being used in that, in that scheme. It can be that count, it can be uh, that London, that Berlin, it'll depend on what, whether it's a CCTLD, whether it's a DTLD, it'll depend on the, on the legislation of the country where that TLD is located. So there's no one answer and there's no one silver bullet to solve it. It's not easy. I would like to say thank you to all of you that you find time to join our project. I also would like to thank you, Carlos, for a very important lecture and very honor to join our project. I hope uh, that uh, you will join our next uh, lectures uh, also and uh, wish you a good evening. Thank you.